Well, my name is <clears throat> Edward F. F for Francis, St. Francis. Tamas, T-A-M-A-S. And uh, my na original name was uh, Tamashunas, full blood Lithuanian. And I made a huge mistake by reducing it in half because of forms you fill out and so forth. Born in 1927, September the 4th. Uh, in uh, February the 9th of 1944, using my brother's birth certificate, which was his age and my name on it, I went down to Philadelphia and joined the Navy, February 9th, 1944. 16 then. Uh, so I already uh, uh, went into uh, the, uh, they sent me down to the Naval Training Station at Bainbridge, Maryland. Had three weeks of boot camp, three weeks. Got the seven-day boot leave and shot out to the Pacific. Uh, but that uh, boot leave, I mean, that, that three weeks of boot camp, they gave everybody tests when he came into the Navy. So uh, about a number, of, I think it was estimated maybe 10 or 20 percent of the young kids, uh, we got a ton of inoculations, and I think... Many of them were getting reactions, and I did too. They called it cat fever, and you ran a high fever, and it went on for days and so forth. So this one gentleman, he was uh, 29 years old, an older guy, right? <laughs> he said, you can't leave. No, he says, no, you can't. He says, everybody has got to take these tests. He says, you can go to sick bay after you take the test. <laughs> you know, at 16 years old, you just, yes, sir, you know. So... I couldn't even write my name on some of those papers. So when they, today I think if somebody tried to get into the Navy and they got those results, I think they'd give them the heave ho. So I got three weeks of the seven day boot leave, standard boot leave, went down to Norfolk, got on a ship, went up to New York Harbor where they were forming a convoy because the submarines were active on the East Coast. We went down the East Coast in a convoy and even had to, we were diverted into Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay, uh, because of submarine problems. So we spent about a week at Gitmo, and uh, we were the first ship out of, the, uh, out of uh, Cuba, and the first ones to transit the Panama Canal. <clears throat> and from then on, we went out into the Pacific uh, without escort, without further escort. We're headed for the New Hebrides Islands uh, no, island, the specific island was Espirito, Cito, Espirito San, Santos, was about 100 miles or something from Australia. Going out into the Pacific, uh, we captain steered a course way southwest. We were 30, over 30 days without sighting land. And uh, an incident that happened on the way out to uh, Espirito Santos was uh, crossing the equator which the Navy, big traditional thing, the captain stopped the ship for three days. We had the initiation. It went from becoming a polywog to a shellback. So they say it was just a fun thing. A polywog, if you've never been through the initiation and never crossed the equator in the Navy. So when you cross the equator the first time, they have a big initiation. In this case, it was a three-day initiation ceremony. And if you could imagine diving off the ship into the ocean, knowing that the ocean was about five miles deep. <laughs> I took one dive in there, boy, I got out of there. I said, that's enough for me. But it was, the, the shellbacks ruled. Uh, officer, rank didn't mean anything. And they had the officers, uh, poor guys, you know, doing like folding toilet paper in the latrine for the, <laughs> the shellbacks. It, it was Navy stuff, you know. And uh, then you became a shellback. So that's how you become a shellback. And so anyway, we got out to Espirito Santos, put us in a tent, and my job was as a stevedore, unloading ships, manual labor. I thought, oh boy. So they had six of us in a tent, no kidding. Uh, and you'd had to muster every six hours. And the ship was in, you know, you'd, then you go to work. If it wasn't, then you go back. So. We were just young kids, and uh, we quickly decided there were maybe 100 or 200 people assembled for muster, like at midnight. You know, and then we send one kid down, one of us would go down, and he'd say, they call the name of one of the kids in the tent, here, here, 
you know, <laughs> and so and then buzz off and sneak back to the tent and go to sleep, you know. So this went on for about two or three days, and the SPs came up, loaded us all up in, in some vehicles. We went, uh, had a, uh, an exec mask, three days bread and water in a brig, <laughs> sent us up to Tulagi. The next job was clearing jungles by hand. So this went on for about two or three days, and the chief came in, and this chief was especially picked. He was an old salt, been in the Navy, you know, like 100 years, but, you know, been in the Navy 25, 30 years. And he was a tough cookie. So he came up and he says, uh, we, we were hacking away at a big tree. And he says, does anybody here know how to run a drag line? And the kid next to me said, uh, what's the drag line? Well, you know, it's a big thing with a boom that goes up and a big bucket with teeth in front and you get in and it loads up and you lift it up like this and, and then you, you get it over and then you dump it out like this and then you go off like this and it casts back in again and, and it's for digging, you know, big wads of, in this case it was coral for making roads. And uh, so he said, okay, come on with me. He says, so he took me where the drag line was. He said, well, there it is. He says, look it over. He says, and... Uh, I'll see you later. And that was it. <laughs> so I got up on there and I look at it, they had all these controls and everything else. So I began learning these controls all morning. So the chief come back, he says, okay. He says, uh, after lunch, he says, you're gonna start loading trucks. After a while, uh, I guess they decided to send me over to the, to the amphibious training base and uh, get in. And then for that first time, I felt like I was really in the Navy getting amphibious training. And I was trained uh, on a landing craft. I was the engineer on a landing craft, take care of the diesel engines. They were great, great marine diesels. There were LCVPs, which were landing craft vehicle personnel, smaller, mainly personnel. Could take a Jeep into a beach or something, but personnel. Then the other ones were larger, all metal, with a big ramp up front. There were two uh, gray marine diesel engines and a twin screw, and that's the kind of boat I was trained on. And later when I got assigned to a ship, uh, when we were rigged on a USS Thirsty uh, AK-25, which I was eventually assigned to when I completed my amphibious training, they had uh, 22 landing craft on the ship, loaded with marines and supplies and everything. This is geared, this is the, the, the configuration geared for battle, okay. And uh, so they assigned, the fleet come in, I got assigned to the Cersei. And my job aboard the Cersei, I was then, be, then, then I was, I don't know if I was promoted from apprentice seaman to machinist mate, motor machinist mate third class. And in the engine room. And what they trained me to do was, uh, this was a steam turbine twin screw driven ship. And uh, which uh, those turbines were driven by a thousand PSI superheated steam. And to produce that steam, you had a process of desalinitizing the seawater, had to be absolutely pure to make the steam to drive it. So without pure water, that ship wasn't going anywhere. So jumping ahead now uh, to uh, the invasion of Okinawa, which was the costliest invasion of all of U.S. naval history. Mm -hmm. Okinawa is located about 400 miles off the coast of Japan, and uh, they knew that Okinawa was going to be the launching pad for the invasion of Japan. And they threw everything at them. And so it was the costliest invasion of all of U.S. naval history in terms of number of ships sunk, number of aircraft lost, and number of personnel killed. And uh, it was on uh, April 1st, 1945, and it was uh, Easter Sunday. The carrier Franklin was operating off the coast of Japan, about 50 miles off the coast of Japan, in March, uh, I think it was March the 16th, and one uh, lone Japanese aircraft came out of the clouds 
and had two bombs, both of which were direct hits, and one of those bombs went through the flight deck into the hangar deck, and the other bomb went down into a munitions, uh, where munitions were stored. And they were both terrific explosions. Uh, the one, the big explosion, uh, there were like, uh, uh, the total loss of life on the Franklin as a result of those two bombs was 765, I think, sailors killed, and beyond that, a number injured. And the sailors on the Franklin, at the risking their own lives and so forth, they fought that fire and got control of the ship and uh, it was able to get underway under its own power. So the Franklin was coming into Ulithi and being as we were at Anchorage, I didn't have a job as far as the evaporators going. We were all set, so I was up on deck. And when a Franklin appeared coming into the channel and in fact, we had to get up emergency steam and drag anchor a little bit to let her come in. So she's coming in at a 14 degree list. And that's what I saw coming in. Is there a big aircraft carrier coming in with listing? And as it turns out, the captain had put uh, the LCM over the side and it happened to be my boat. So I was able to get in there and all the officers and a number of enlisted personnel as well. We ended up uh, just circling the Franklin. As, as a number of other small craft did. And at that time, you know, we didn't speak, we just waved at them, we had no idea the, the damage they had suffered and so forth. Shortly thereafter, we head out and on the way to Okinawa. So as it turns out, four o'clock, I got off watch, ready to hit the sack and you know, I'm pooped. And uh, Urga, 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 General Quarters, General Quarters, all hands, man your battle stations. May I grab my life jacket and up to the up to the boat deck, get on my LCM. They issued us steel helmets, a automatic machine gun type weapon, uh, 45 automatic pistols, a bunch of hand grenades, <laughs> a, a, a thing for shooting uh, flares and so forth, you know, and some boxes of K rations. So down over the side we go and uh, the young Marines all geared up in battle gear, just like you see in the movies, and they're coming down over the cargo nets into the, our boat. So we get it all loaded up. They say, okay, you rendezvous with the Coast Guard cutter, heading out to the beach, and you can see the Coast Guard cutter. So we get over there with the Coast Guard cutter. He said, okay, line up in the second wave, and uh, which we did. It was long second wave, and long first wave. We're all waiting to go in. In the meantime, uh, airplanes bombing the beach and so forth. And there were, at Okinawa, I think there were nine battleships also bombarding the beach. So then we ended up unloading all the cargo and munitions and supplies we had aboard ship. It was a pretty large cargo ship. And uh, so the procedure was at Okinawa was you'd go in and the Coast Guard guy, was he'd be shooting flares at us and he'd say, you know, Wait, wait, you have to wait for the tide because the tide, because there were shoals and coral and all that stuff, you know. And the young coxswain, I don't remember his name. The other crew guy was a kid by the name of Zanitas. I remember his name. But the kid that was running, I said, look, I said, hey, just go ahead. I said, remember that lecture we got on this LSD? LSD is a landing ship, dock type ship. It's a huge, I mean, you can't miss it, and it's hollow inside, and it has doors on the back, or else it has booms on the side. So they're there if you're in trouble and you need some help on your boat. So we went in, we tore up our screws until we couldn't go anymore, and they came out with a thing they call a cherry picker with a boom, and uh, unloaded the boat, and then it would refloat itself. So we go limping back, you know, uh, and heading for this LSD. And the LSD, we got to the LSD, they'd pick us up, back, put two new screws on, come on, off we go. So we just kept doing that, and uh, after a while, uh, they even ran out of screws. They set up a blacksmith shop in the well deck, and they were bronzing and repairing screws and everything else, but they kept us supplied with screws. We could tear up all the screws we want. So about the third day, the, uh, the deck officer who was keeping track of all the loading, he said, what are you guys doing? 
We said, well, explain what we're doing. He said, well, pass the word, pass the word. Well, we never saw any of the other boats from our ship because it was such a, everything going on. We just, you know, if we did, we'd say, tell, tell them what we're doing. At night, uh, during that invasion, at, at evening, they would get the smoke boats out. And the smoke boats would be going back and forth across the whole area. The seas were calm, and there were all these 600 and 700, 800 ships at Anchorage, a uh, huge armada of ships for the invasion. Uh, so we could see our ship way off in the distance. <laughs> so then all we do is go putt, 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 till you bump into something, and you tie up for the night and slept on the boat. And that's where we slept on the boat throughout the whole, all the time we were at Okinawa. And one particular night, uh, there must have been about 15 or 20 boats all tied up one to the other. We're all snoring away or sleeping on, on the deck of the boat. And some Jap came in and uh, strafing, and these shells were about 10 feet off the fantail of all these boats. And if he'd been 10 feet over, he would have got us all, you know. So we lucked out in that particular incident. We finally uh, took the last load in, and uh, they were waiting for us to come back. I mean, they, they were... as soon as we got up to the ship, okay, got the hook into the lift ring. You know, there's four cables, there's a big lift ring, and they got the big iron hook coming in, it's got it in there, you know. And the captain must have given the order, <laughs> flank speed, you know, because boy, we took off. And so we're bouncing on, you know, on the water until it, you know, and then finally we cleared the waves and got up aboard ship and we're back home again, our home sweet home. Then we, uh, uh, we anchored off the islands of Saipan and Tinian for a couple of days. And on uh, Saipan and Tinian, we were able to observe the B-29s at that time. Uh, it was, there was a, like a cliff or something. The B-29s had come off the runway, and they were so heavily loaded with bombs, and they were just sort of, uh, you know, but they had enough power, and none of them ever went in. And so we were able to watch the B-29s going off their bombing runs. And while we were there, the PA system came alive, said, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, report to the wardroom, our little boat crew. I said, report to the wardroom? I said, that's no man's land for enlisted people like me. You know? I said, whoa, what did we do? We were, did we, uh, the, the Coast Guard guy shooting those flares, and we tore up all those crews? I mean, no kidding. I was like, because we tore up all those crews or what? I had no idea. So we get up there, and the uh, officers... Uh, were uh, all assembled. The uh, purpose of calling us up there was to commend us for having removed more than half of the cargo from the ship, which then enabled us to exit the battle area. And uh, as our reward, he broke out a bottle of uh, liquor from his liquor cabinet, <laughs> poured everybody a drink. <laughs> and I had never drank any whiskey before at all. and so. Everybody, you know, we're in our dungarees and so forth, you know, kind of a little bit dirty and all that stuff. So, okay, so I see you watch these guys, you know, down it like a like an old veteran. So I said, and I gagged and coughed, and everybody burst out laughing. And uh, so I went back to work, a pretty happy sailor. Then we headed out of there, and we were heading to... Uh, to San Francisco. As it turns out, my boss, my Navy boss, a machinist made first class, he uh, became ill and we were all so overworked. I got out of the Navy, I was six foot two, I weighed 130 pounds. Uh, and he particularly uh, was a driving uh, workhorse in the engine room. And he became ill, so we were diverted into Pearl Harbor, and he went over the side in the Stokes basket. They took him up to the hospital, and he died two days later. So uh, we buried him at the uh, National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. So that's how come we were at Pearl Harbor when the war ended. We were anchored out into Pearl Harbor, and... Uh, 
war came to an end. So the captain gave everybody liberty. There's no port and starboard, you know, or just everybody got liberty. Empty the ship. And in Honolulu at the time, it was pandemonium. I mean, literally pandemonium. Everybody was... And at that time, they would sell sailors liquor by the drink, or military people would sell them by the drink. But now, anything goes. <laughs> uh, so me, like a drunken sailor, you know, I did. I mean, it was just, you're just caught up in the euphoria. You know, everybody's... So I went into this liquor store, and they had all this kind of Hawaiian you know, liquor, you know, just every variety. So I said, give me a bottle of this and a bottle of that, you know. <laughs> so I go out of the, no kidding, I go out of there. Uh, by that time, I was, I guess I was 17, maybe approaching 18 already. But uh, so I uncorked the one bottle and took a couple of big swigs out of the thing. And uh, I get out in a hot sun, you know, and I didn't get a half a block. And everything starts swirling like this. So I said, well, wait a minute. So there was a public, nice looking, I remember a public building across the street with a nice green lawn was kind of like on a slope a little bit. So I made it across the street, got up in the middle of that lawn, and I sat down and I put one bottle here. And I remember I put one bottle here. Definitely remember doing that. Then I laid back and when I laid back, the whole world was spinning like this. I mean, I was just, and then I, passed out apparently. I woke up in my bunk aboard ship. No, they had to carry me uh, down to the pier. They had to carry me into the boat that took us out to the ship. They had to carry me up the gangway. They had to carry me down three decks in my bunk down below. About the third deck down my bunk was the third one up. I woke up in my bunk. <laughs> After the war, they didn't just let you out of the Navy. You, they still had to run the Navy, so you had to get points. So I didn't get out of the Navy until June of 1946. After I got out of the Navy, I had no high school. Right. And uh, I didn't want to, uh, to use my GI Bill for high school. So instead of going to this little town in Pennsylvania, my mother had passed away when I was 11. And my father became incapacitated. He was a coal miner. And he became incapacitated in a coal mine accident. And so he was in a hospital uh, with, uh, with permanent injuries. And our family life just disappeared, so to speak. So instead of going back to Pennsylvania, I said, well, let's see now. They have a lot of automobile factories up in Detroit, so I ended up in Detroit, Michigan. What happened was, uh, I think again, somebody from church, I think got me a job at a General Motors plant as a plant protection guard. Had I just stayed in that line of work, I would have become a chief of plant protection. You go around, you meet everybody, it was a wonderful <laughs> setup and everything else. But I was in the in the uh, transmission plant in Livonia, Michigan, and it just so happened they ended up having a huge fire. And of the two people that died in that fire, one of them was my supervisor. So at that time, you know, I still had the GI Bill, and I wanted to uh, go to college. And uh, they, uh, I thought, well, you know, I said this shouldn't have happened. This, this shouldn't have happened. So, how did, so I found out there was a degree in fire protection engineering and safety engineering at the Illinois Institute of Technology. So I set my sights on becoming a fire protection engineer. But certainly it, it was a major impact because uh, I was in that period during my development years. I didn't go to a prom and I didn't have any high school. I, I missed all that dating and so forth. I was doing serious adult work. And uh, in the Navy, the Navy motto, uh, which I think would be a pretty good idea to have universal military training in our country, because uh, the, uh, you know, a year in the service or even two years in the service of people transiting from, uh, from going through their adolescence and becoming an adult and being subjected to discipline and responsibility and teamwork and everything else, in the Air Force, by the way, you know, I got in the Air Force to nullify the expiration date of my GI Bill. 
because if I didn't start college in, in three, in, in four years, you lost it. It would expire. So loving airplanes, so if I got in the Army Air Corps, which shortly then after became the U.S. Air Force, again, I had an unbelievable experience in the Air Force. Got out of the uh, Air Force in June of 1950, and then I'd been in there on June the 23rd of 1950. Everybody in the military was frozen, and I would have been in it for the Korean War. Well, liberty, uh, and I guess you couple that with freedom. And of course, you know, if freedom is not free. And uh, so much blood has been spilt for the freedom of this country.